And last but not least, we have Robin Palmer, who's a, a land specialist currently with Makaro Consulting, um, previously for many years with, with, with Oxfam. And Robin is going to give us a very brief commentary on a lot of panels which have taken place at the African Studies Association in the last few days on land matters. Robin. Thank you. Um, I want to tell you about a meeting in London this week. At the cost of a mere £2,295, you can attend the World Agriculture Investment Conference at the Regent's Park Marriott Hotel, where you'll be able to learn, quote, why is, is it time to invest in agriculture right now? How to identify the best agricultural opportunities from across the globe? Meet and network with key investors and agribusinesses from across the globe? Apparently, there are limited regions in the world which have sufficient land with good agri-production climates and potential. These regions are still relatively low priced, so the future capital gain opportunity is very good. Moreover, you'll be able to learn more in two days than you can through months of research. <laughs> Who could ask them more? <laughs> <laughs> 2000. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so you're urged, <laughs> sign up for your ticket Bit today ahead. and reap the rewards. <laughs> <laughs> this is, there you go. So down, down we go to the um, Regent's Park Marriott Hotel. Um, that sort of thing is why I'm interested in land grabbing. Um, I've written a little four-page rant here in the um, Macoro News, which people can um, take away with them. Um, I've been turning it into a, into a proper, a thing proper, you know, for proper academics to look at. So I've stuffed it full of footnotes, about 100 footnotes, <laughs> and turned it into a 20-page article. <laughs> which will soon be appearing on the Oxfam Land Rights website, along with a couple of updated bibliographies on biofuels, land rights in Africa, and global land grabbing, uh, combined with an annotated guide to the bibliographies, which includes an interesting section on journal articles, one on books, and one on TV, video, and radio clips, which I would commend to you. Okay. Um, So last week, um, we, um, I organized a half a dozen panels at the African Studies Association of the UK. These were on uh, historical reflections, um, post land in post-conflict situations, a couple of ones on fast track in Zimbabwe, something on women's land rights, and something on land grabbing. And um, the issue of tenure was, was was a fairly constant issue through all those through all those sessions in in one sense or another. Your name was invoked on more than one occasion. I accept responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just want to run through um, some of the comments made. Lionel Cliff, as many of you will know, was doing an interesting study of comparative study of land reform in Kenya, Zimbabwe, South Africa, um, and. Um, he makes the interesting point that whereas uh, South Africa transferred existing farms intact, Kenya and Z in Kenya and Zimbabwe they were th there was subdivision, and implicit in the South African notion was that was a one of group farming, um, which was he says is a weird thing to have to, to contemplate in in a market um, context, and this was very much in a sense, I guess, pressure from the World Bank at the time. Um, so. Um, the problem now in South Africa, one of the problems now in South Africa is what entities do you put in place now that things have collapsed, now that the original you know, land reform systems have, have pretty much broken down. The state has now become a major landlord and is leasing land out to land reform beneficiaries. Um, in the meantime, a lot, of a lot of land reform land has leaked back to white farmers, kind of like a sort of counter land reform. There has been a green paper on offer in South Africa. It's been supposed to have been out in the middle of the year. It was presented to cabinet. It's been delayed. There's talk of limiting private ownership. There's been strong lobbying from AgriSA, the um, Commercial Farmers <coughs> Union, and lots of infighting from within, um, within the ANC. So a lot of interesting stuff going on in South Africa. In Kenya, um, Lionel made the point that nothing in the Kenya land reform program worked out in the way in which it was intended. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and also that not much, nobody did much lesson learning in further south from, from the Kenyan experiences. 
interesting point about lots of women forming support groups and buying land as groups in, in, the, um, in response to um, a whole series of, of, of things going on. Um, finally, in Zimbabwe, um, growing pressures, and Mandy can talk about this, I think, growing pressures to restore property rights, um, including in the communal areas, um, following the, the model of the wonderful Hernando de Soto, that, you know, give people property and everything will turn to gold. Um, Terence Ranger thought this was an absolutely disastrous idea. Um, there's a land audit going on. Our man here is, is, it, is, is, is part of it, uh, probably the chair of it. Well, there's only 32 of you, aren't there? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Nothing happening. Um, it's off and it's on, it's off and it's on. Um, originally, MDC, the opposition party, former opposition, the party w wanted freehold. Now, according to Sam Moyer, they're happy with, with leasehold on it. Um, we heard about high-profile evictions of people in Mazoe district close to Harare, people who thought they had security of tenure, finding themselves being evicted in the new round of, 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 um, of um, land invasions. But essentially around all this was debates about what form of tenure. Um, in Zimbabwe at the moment, tenure issues seem to be a bit hot issue, but the comment was made from a very technocratic perspective. Um, not, and, and just the very final point, um, do you go from the bottom up or do you go top down? Well, for the, ever since 1890, Rhodesia, Southern Rhodesia, Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, etc., have always been gone on a very much top down okay. technocratic thing. And, and it's very, very hard to break that mold. And one example, when people um, went on to land invasions, they settled themselves in straight lines so that they were official settlers and they would get they would benefit from agricultural extension. This is what had always happened and this is how so you've got to do it in in a proper <coughs> way. A bit like <coughs> having um in Malawi I remember you used to have to the way you could fly over and you'd see Union Jacks on the ground from the way things were, were done. So um, it will be a long struggle I think to get bottom up reform in Zimbabwe. Sorry that was rather rushed but I was only given about three minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Okay, questions, reactions, um, lady here in the front row. Stick those, stick those down the end where people can pick yeah. them up. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, can you, can, can, can you give your name and affiliation first, please? Um, Mrs. Selva Ratnam, Women for Justice and Peace. Um, Stephen Hawking has just said, uh, man um, exit the planet or get extinct. Uh, that means a lot. Uh, we, our problems are increasing. Um, how do we deal with them? How do we increase the prospects of world peace and prosperity? Um, when, I, when he said uh, uh, India is buying so much of land from Madagascar, that outrages me. I am scared uh, that if you think of all the things that are related to India, and then if you think of all the things that are related to Madagascar, then you will be able to see um, it in the context so that you will be able to deal with that um, in a better way. Our, uh, if I am asking this uh, in, at this place so many times, if we have a concept map with all the factors related, they are all complex, they are all uh, interlinked with each other. If we have it in, our, in front of our eyes, it may make a better sense. Okay, that is one thing. Uh, land grabbing, I'm going to tell you a very peculiar case, um, uh, Sri Lanka internal colonialism in an island, where at the beginning of um, independence, um, land grabbed uh, from the minorities uh, by the majorities, uh, uh, by the government allocating um, to landless um, ethnic minor majority uh, instead of uh, sharing it with the a landless ethnic minority. That was one stage. And the second stage was uh, going for development and expelling the uh, ethnic minority from certain area and then put up an irrigation tank or a dam and then bring in ethnic majority. That's land. And then in the last, in 2006 and 2007, they uh, bombed the ethnic minority people. They kept forming from Tringamali up to uh, Batikalo. They expelled them 
and then they, they grab the land and they have given it to the uh, Sinhalese people. So that is uh, one form of land grabbing there. So what do people in internal colonialism do? Thank you. Okay, well, let's, let's collect one or two more. Um, gentlemen over on the right, gentlemen <coughs> over on the left. Couple there on the front row. One of the talk, I think it was the first talk, mentioned that national budgets in Africa for agriculture were going down or were too small. And you, but you talk about the concern over direct foreign investment. So, what about foundations like the Gates Foundation? Is it is it wise to dissolve um, national policies or national agricultural policies to these kind of foundations? Okay. Yeah, the gen gentleman there. Uh, Pete, Peter Baker from Cabby. Uh, I find this all a bit gloomy. Uh, have you got any <laughs> sort of success stories in <laughs> from Africa <laughs> yeah, and where it's actually CNN worked? <laughs> okay. BBC. <laughs> um, the, the, the lady here in the yellow top. Yeah. <laughs> Diane Dumashi, thank you. Um, it's a bit of a, a comment as well as a, a question. Uh, the comment is, has either of the speaker been involved in the UN Habitat GLTN, <laughs> Global Land Tools Network? Um, initiative which has been going on for several years now. Uh, specifically, they also have a continuum of land rights um, which mirrors actually your conclusion vis-a-vis -vis the basket of use or bar basket of rights that you mentioned. So I think there's some lessons there, cross lessons there. Question is, um, one of their key things is gender equitable access to land mm. through um, making sure they have a suite of tools to try and affect, uh, influence land policy. Do you really think in your mind's eye and with your experience that creating access for women in rural, as well as urban areas, but probably in rural areas, given agricultural production, is actually possible? Lady on the back row there, and then we'll have another round. Hi. Um, I would like to talk about uh, the topic about the w water resources, which um, Mr. Woodland talked about. There are lots of places, um, for instance, in Uganda, where there are lots of water, but um, people are not, um, people need help. I mean, not help need to be educated how they can use that water to irrigate the land where that water passes. But the water is really there, which can be used efficiently to irrigate the land and make use of the land during the dry season. But the only thing which people don't have is how to use that water and how to use simple methods of irrigation without using a lot of money to invest into that irrigation system. Is there any plans which can be, um, is there people who are interested in making small um, ideas which can help people use that sort of um, water to, to develop their land other than big, big pictures which are really made? Okay, let's, let's get some responses to some of those questions. Question about ethnic conflict and land. What about the Gates Foundation and other private foundations? Have we got any successes? What about gender and land? And what about appropriate small-scale irrigation? Mandy. Oh, uh, thanks. We'll go now. Yeah, I'll start. Uh, yeah, yeah pick, two or three. Pick ones on which you feel inspired to. It's gloomy. Uh, th and the reason why it's all gloomy, in my own opinion, and it's not a, it's, 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 it's that 2008, when we had the uh, teetering of the global financial uh, uh, markets and the food uh, prices spiked and uh, things have not been the same was a signal that we are reaching the limits of industrial agriculture and urbanization. The world is not going to continue the way it has over the last few hundred years. And certainly it's not going to be easy to, 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 to find substitutes for bio, uh, you know, fossil fuels 
and be able to continue living the same kind of, of civilization that we have experienced. And for Africa being the poorest region in the world, it actually means that we, we are just behind the curve. We, we are trying to industrialize Africa when it's, it's quite clear that uh, maybe industrializing agriculture is, is not the way for Africa. Uh, in fact, I would argue that uh, it, it's, it's not likely to be the answer uh, at all. So the, the gloominess is not just uh, from the industrial world, which is trying to recover its economies, but for Africans, it's like a double jeopardy. You, you're uh, trying to imitate, but then you find that uh, you maybe you're imitating something that you should stop imitating. It's very, very difficult. They, 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 uh, because of this lack of holistic view of how are we going, what kind of advanced uh, human civilization are we looking at? 50, 100 years from now. It's, there's no serious debate about it. Uh, the Americans and the Chinese are still fighting about uh, who, who's gonna reduce more uh, atmospheric poison than the other without jeopardizing economic prowess, blah, blah. So it's gonna take time. Uh, global common is a big issue for the future. So um, African governments may and have not spent enough on, on agriculture, that's for sure. But, but at the same time, uh, uh, there are other ideas which have come from, I believe some foundations and NGOs probably have a more sustainable solution than the Gates Foundation. Uh, and, and I'm pretty friendly with the Gates Foundation, but they, the major difference between the Gates Foundation and, and other kind of, call them mainstream ideas, is that for the Gates Foundation, the solution is purely technological. Uh, because Gates Foundation's idea of the world and his idea of philanthropy is that there's always a silver bullet for everything. They, 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 there is one technological solution. Technology is more important than people. It's, it's, it's development is about people. Development is not about doing things for people. Development is empowering people that can fashion out their own history. So putting up a few large seed companies which produce seed for every African farmer and then uh, one company that produces fertilizers mm. for the half the continent is not the solution for Africa. It's about African farmers uh, being able to build similar size industries, but, but through a, um, an amalgamation of small producers adding up their produce <coughs> to large industries rather than a few large companies doing everything for everybody. It's not going to work, I'm sorry to say. And uh, I, I suppose those are the two main points that I was going to answer to. The, the thing on the land audit in Zimbabwe is not happening yet because it's, it's, it's happening slowly because uh, the political process is slow. I think when the f once political reforms Accelerate the audit will also be more conclusive. Yeah, that's what Sorry I would say. say. Yeah. So, would you like to pick out one or, one or more of those questions? Positive. I mean, I think one of the things we can say is that there are instances where um, development can happen very quickly, and um, and I think this gives the lie to the sense that things can't happen. Um, case study that I did in, in, in Mali uh, quite a few years ago involved um, looking at what happened when a dam had been constructed in one country and the reservoir extended actually further upstream where it wasn't, nobody expected it to go. As a result, water was available to populations in a completely unplanned way. I mean, the, the basically, you had a river that was dry most of the year, and it, seized, it became flooded for part of the year because of the reservoir downstream had backed up. <coughs> what happened? Brilliant. Within four years, that mm. population of that area, which is not a densely populated area by any means, had cleared 6,000 hectares of floodplain land and planted it with rice. Now, you know, that seems to me to be quite a, an impressive achievement. In Kajiado district in Kenya, it's an area that was reserved by the British for um, wildlife, and it was reserved as a semi-arid area. It wasn't supposed to be used for agriculture at all. Um, from the 1960s, 1970s, uh, mostly immigrants, but also some Maasai were living there, cut furrows to take water off the streams, draining off Mount Kilimanjaro, and created an irrigation system, an irrigated area there, which is now one of the main pr tomato producing areas of Kenya. It sits, as it happens, on the main road between Mombasa and Nairobi. But again, <coughs> in both those cases, 
there was almost no government involvement whatsoever. In the Malian case, the government wasn't even sure that it had happened. <laughs> <laughs> there were no extension <laughs> agents or anything of that kind. Now, I'm not saying that this is a case for bottom-up development. I'm just saying that under the circumstances where resources become available and where there are market conditions, uh, then people were, are capable of reacting very fast. There's a vast irrigation system that's been cut, again, by, by uh, people you know, acting pretty much without any outside support on the border between um, Mozambique and Zimbabwe. Much of this was done by Zimbabwean farm workers who've been, who were leaving Zimbabwe and settled on the, the frontier area. There were two activities. One was gold mining, small-scale gold mining, and the other was this irrigated farming system. We, and they cut furrows to distribute water around. This is an extremely dynamic area. Now, with, as with all gold rush areas, it's not very pretty. But I think one can, what one needs to understand is that circumstances in, in many parts of Africa are extremely dynamic. Things will happen very quickly when people see an opportunity. And as I said before, one needs to have a sense that Africa is full of people who are moving around. The idea that Africa is made up of people sitting in villages waiting for something to happen, I think is extremely uh, unhelpful, uh, in my view. Um, and, and so, do you call these, these successes? I think that there is, that certainly there is evidence of, uh, if you like, potential for things to happen very quickly. The question is, what should channel that? What kind of support should, should, would be productive? You mentioned the idea of supplemental irrigation which I think is one of the huge questions. Is, you know, why has it never happened? You know, Africa's exploitation of water resources is absolutely tiny. Mm. In India, it's 35% of water is used, for, largely for agriculture. In Africa, it is 2 to 3%. I mean, it's nothing. So what actually happened? Why, why is this? Certainly, we know that during the 1970s, there were a lot of efforts to build irrigation, and there was a lot of... Um, problems that arose, many of those problems arising out of land tenure, as it happened, and hand-fisted efforts to, to try and overcome those. We know that during the 1980s and 90s, there was virtual moratorium on international investment in irrigation in Africa. Nobody invested anything at all. We now know that, oh, we're going to <coughs> double the irrigation in Africa within five years. This is what the Commission for Africa says. So suddenly, we want to put irrigation in Africa. My question is, do people understand what went wrong last time? Is anybody interested in finding out? Because, again, when you put in an irrigation system or when you increase the productivity of land, one thing you can be sure of, the value of land will increase. Therefore, where you have confused <laughs> or potentially conflicting claims over land, those must intensify because people will want more of it. So you could actually be unleashing problems, unless you look at the land issue properly. Uh, women, and this relates to that, I, I hate to say this, but I, I wonder whether actually the best route for women to acquire more land is through land markets. Now, I mean, I wouldn't normally go <laughs> down that route, but the intractability of some of the problems of, of customary tenure make me wonder whether women grouping together and forming syndicates to buy land may actually, because once you've bought land, then that's your land. You're not, dep you're not beholden to any senior relatives or anything like that, or in-laws or anybody who would then claim the land from you. So I wonder whether, you know, that in, a, in, in some way this may be an instance of markets being a liberating force, but I'm I'm not prepared to <laughs> apply that as a, as, a, as a recommendation at this stage, but it's something that doesn't, you know, I wonder whether that's the case. Can I go? Yes. Quickly. Um, success stories. Um, yep, there are. Um, even in Zimbabwe's fast track land reform program, read the book by Ian Schoons coming out with James Curry in November, Ian Schoons and colleagues. Um, tools, GLTN tools. Um, not a fan of tools or codes of conduct or voluntary guidelines. 
someone described these last week as Boy Scout guidelines, and I think that sort of sums it up rather well. Um, gender. Um, very good book by Baker Englert and Liz Daly, Women's Land Rights in Eastern Africa. What they suggest is really very much a pragmatic approach that don't come with a single model, that go with what works in any, any particular context. That, you know, northern Uganda is different <coughs> from southern Uganda, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so be, um, go with what works, and whether that is the customary or some version of it, or whether it's the modern, and I agree with the comment actually that book buying as 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 um, as groups of people as is happening in Kenya, particularly when you've got issues of property grabbing and the HIV and AIDS um, epidemic, um, women become very vulnerable in, in that kind of context. Um, but there are there are success stories within that that book I just mentioned on on um, women's land rights in Eastern Africa. So it's not all doom and gloom, but a lot of it is. Thank you. Look, for, for, for those of you with an eye on the clock, I'm afraid I have mismanaged the time, but um, with, 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 with your permission, I'll, I'll, I'll go on till quarter, quarter past, uh, another seven or eight minutes. So that's just enough time for two or three more questions. I didn't look this way last time. Lady there in the blue. Yes, sorry. <laughs> 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 blue or am I I'm colorblind? <laughs> sorry. Um, you c commented on um, productivity of small scale versus large scale. I wonder if you could say something about sustainability. Uh, gentleman, Benny over on the, on the, on the back, and, and then we'll, yes. Um, with your respect, um, should we not be, sorry, my name is Den Bitzer, Benny Den Bitzer. Um, should we not be looking at the main reason why there is a push for land grabbing? There is a huge uh, global food famine on the horizon because there are so many interests in producing more food or grabbing the food that is available. And countries, for example, like Saudi Arabia, in order to save water at home, mm -hmm. are now buying land in Africa, for example. Mm -hmm. Korea has done the same thing as we have heard. So isn't there a danger that whilst we are all very you know, studiously studying these issues, we're missing the point. Now, um, Mandy, you, you did make the point about uh, Gates, but one of the things that Gates has done, and I agree with you, the approach to you know, big farms and so on is not something that one would share. What he has done by enabling the World Food Program to place orders with local producers over a period of several harvests ahead he is putting money into the hands of the farmer exactly as one would wish because then, through the help of social structures, women will have more power. I should elaborate more, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. Thank you. Maybe down here on the front row, second along in the front row. Annabelle Martin Barr, <coughs> uh, UCL RAS, and I'm a resident of Senegal. Um, what's going to happen to the nomads and the pastoralists and the sand people with all this uh, land business, what's going to happen to them? And if not the Gates Foundation, how about the Mo Ibrahim Foundation? Okay, and we'll take one more from the lady here. Um, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Louise from Stanley. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit when you were talking about the efficiency of large and small scale uh, farming. You talked about measurement in terms of um, output per unit and labor, but I'm just wondering whether we're not going to have to really change how we measure some of the outputs, particularly in light of food security issues. And I wonder how we measure the kind of outputs in terms of food security. So when you start to industrialize, very often you turn over to modern cultivations, um, biofuels, etc. Are we not going to have to really measure output in other, uh, in other ways? Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to have to truncate it at this point and, and go back I'll to our panelists. Okay, I'll pass. Uh, Thank you. You'll pass. Yeah, I was going to do it in reverse order. So, Phil, um, questions on sustainability. Uh, are we missing the point on the land grabs, fate of pastoralists, um, hunters, gatherers, and so on? 
And um, uh, yeah, are we are we measuring the right things? Yeah, sustainable. I mean, I think that part of the the uh, you know, part of the concern, I suppose, about farming is that uh, there is a widespread perception that uh, what you could call industrial farming, I mean, the, the, the farming that actually prevails in most developed countries, um, is unsustainable, um, and and is like it's become less so. Um, sorry, it's becoming more unsustainable as uh, certain things change, like the price of oil, which quite obviously will certainly make it much less supportable economically, um, but also uh, pressures to mitigate climate change would mean that uh, uh, industrial agriculture would be expected to use much less um, oil and, and indeed to become carbon neutral. I mean, there are those kinds of pressures. And I mean, I've seen papers produced by the world, by the FAO, that seem quite sanguine about this. And they say, well, actually, large-scale farming could become carbon neutral by undertaking a couple of things, becoming organic, basically, and adopting what they call conservation tillage, which <coughs> means that you don't plow. You, 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 well, conservation tillage normally uses pesticides, I mean, herbicides, as things stand. But they say that there are other ways of doing it. Now, in other words, if the FAO takes this view that basically says, well, we're, but we could tweak the large-scale system a bit, and actually suddenly it's become much more sustainable. There are still issues, it seems to me, about how you transport the stuff around the world, world and so forth. I mean, there, you know, there, are, there are transport costs and so forth. In other words, it's probably not just the production system that one needs to look at. It's the whole distribution system, big retail, big uh, distribution depots, all that kind of stuff heavy refrigeration, you know, th these kinds of things. So, I mean, I think it's, there, there are, surely there have to be concerns about the present system. But, as I say, there are influential organizations that see this as being simply a technical matter of tweaking the technology a bit, and we'll be fine. Now, I'm not sure that I would necessarily go along with them, but there's certainly views there. I think that the concerns with sustainability have led people to say, well, maybe we should be going more small scale, more labor intensive, and so on. And it's at this point that I start to say, but okay, what would this look like? What would more labor intensive farming look like? How labor intensive? And is it possible to sustain lifestyles that we would accept by going down that route? Or would people actually refuse to do it? I think there are, there are big questions. We don't actually have very good working models of labor-intensive, small-scale farming that, hold, that basically create good standards of living. Most people who are doing that kind of farming are extremely poor and definitely don't want to carry on doing it. And I think we have to, we have to face up to this, that you know, it's fine. I do really worry about an over-romanticizing of small-scale farming here. Um, there are many, many, ha many, many families who have been um, have been resettled in the Brazilian countryside as a result of the movimento sem terras, the, the landless movement. And I think it's going to be a real question: Will those young people, the the children of those settlers, will they stay on the land? Historically, we know that most farming communities have lost their young people who have left the land. Now, the question is, can we reverse that? So I, I, I think there are a series of questions there. We have to confront them. I, and, and I think labor productivity is part of that issue. If you have to generate a sufficient income from your labor. Now, his, you know, the, the way many people do it in Europe, for example, is that they do other work as well as farm work. And so you have a sustaining of small-scale farming by dint of people earning money doing something else. And Jan van der Ploeg, who's, who's the advocate of the new peasantries, says that is how it's done in Holland, for example. That's how the, the, the peasantry in Holland sustain themselves, is effectively by taking part in the labor market where they earn money, which then effectively subsidizes their farming. Okay, so maybe that's the model we have to think of. But I think we have to, we have to be fairly hard-headed about, about how that happens. Um, Denbitz, yes, the... the, um, the are we overlooking the, the problem about the, the food famine? Um, I'm not 
I'm not perhaps as worried about shortage of food as perhaps many people are. I think there are there are clearly big demands on, on certain kinds of, of agricultural output. Biofuel seems to be almost limitless demand, as long as the United States government and the European Union are prepared to subsidize it. Mm. It's not a commercial proposition, except that it's subsidized. So, you know, there are questions there. Pastoralists, um, I'm afraid I think they're probably you know, they, they have been historically victimized by almost every system, every political system <laughs> they've lived under. Um, I'm not sure that's going to change. Mandy, you have the last word. Okay, thank you. The, the issue of uh, small scale, large scale productivity, sustainability, uh, I guess has to be looked at in a more dynamic sense uh, over time. Uh, uh, one of my earlier comments was uh, how everything can make sense in within a certain context and then immediately it doesn't make sense in a larger context or vice versa. And that's certainly where we are in terms of uh, human civilization. So uh, in terms of industrial agriculture, spurring urban industrial growth, uh, et cetera, in the world and uh, food surpluses. Uh, uh, the irony, for instance, is that uh, the United States can quote, uh, export food aid uh, because their farmers are overproducing. Uh, 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 but at the same time, that, that system of production is polluting, uh, is causing more climate change <laughs> than anything else. Uh, meaning that Africans are going to increasingly need probably food aid in the, in the next uh, foreseeable f future. So in many ways, what aid is doing and, and what needs to actually happen for sustainable development is another thing. So industrial agriculture, heavy duty, may appear to be highly productive, a high rate of return per unit labor, et cetera, but at a global level, it's a disaster. So this inability, by, uh, this inability to, 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 to have agreement between the development uh, world, uh, the, uh, the World Banks and the UNs and, and so on, They're the inability to get national governments, or let me put it politically since uh, it's the last one. Since you come from Zimbabwe. Since I come from Zimbabwe, let me put it politically. In 2008, it occurred to me, something that had never occurred to me before, that uh, once faced with food insecurity, Highly developed industrial nations start behaving like developing countries. Yeah, absolutely. The only difference is that if it happens in the United States, as an example, once any issue whatsoever becomes a national security issue for a powerful country like the United States, you can be rest assured the rest are secondary issues. So we can sit here and complain and analyze uh, land grabbing in Africa, but if it is a, an immediate solution to a, to a perceived security issue, then it's going to be done. So this is the world we live in today, that uh, although Africans are poor, but at least one thing that the world can learn from the Africans is how to deal with common issues and dialogue them and try and get a consensus around, okay, we, we specialize that it is African at village level and, and small plants. But the world is desperate for capacity to sit at Copenhagen and actually come up with, with a way forward that allows us to know at a global level what type of agriculture generally should we pushing for, forward if it's gonna be sustainable development for everybody. Now, in terms of return, of course, uh, any factor can, have high return depending on what is the most limiting factor. So at any point in time, a society has to figure out what is the most limiting factor on our agriculture at the moment, as an example. If it's labor, then you, re you maximize returns to labor, but it may not be labor, it could be capital, it could actually be land. So as long as you've got 70% of Africans still on the rural uh, 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 and are not urban, you can be rest assured that for a long time, it is important to make sure that uh, a return to land becomes important because there are so many people out there seated on that land. So I'll, 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 I'll sum that up 
by saying sustainability is a dynamic issue. At a point in time when uh, there's rapid urbanization, industrialization, yes, it makes sense to go for larger scale, consolidate, because that will lead to sustainability for that period, as long as you can deal with other climate issues. When it comes to, uh, 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 um, uh, the, the, as, I, as I said, you know, the issue of uh, uh, sh short and long term solutions is always uh, 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 important. In terms of food insecurity in general, I would say, wherever it is, not just Africa, poverty is the major reason for food insecurity. So at least you can say the long-term solution to food insecurity is economic development, uh, if poverty is the main cause. But then long-term development can take very long. <laughs> so what do you do in the meantime if a responsible government to ensure that people don't fall through the cracks? That's where you start having policies which may contradict each other. A short-term policy may then contradict a long-term desire for broad-based economic development. So it's, it's, it's pretty, t so I, wh whilst I like Gates Foundation's idea of buy local so that uh, World Food Program, uh, uh, which is more responsible than other UN agencies. Uh, I think only, of that, uh, only of recent. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that is uh, 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 highly positive. And finally, on the issue of uh, the most, uh, d I'm just, I'm working with an organization called Africa Forum right now to do a study on the marginalized communities of Africa, of which I'm not a fundi, I'm just learning more about it myself. One of the cases, uh, the, the nomads, uh, the pastoralists, they were the Basaro people in Botswana, Namibia, uh, South Africa, a uh, uh, very, very important and interesting case. Uh, and it all goes back to the point that uh, these communities, which are being subjugated by some of the most democratic governments, uh, Botswana is supposed to be the most democratic, uh, responsible government in Africa today. But I had a uh, one-on-one -on -one conversation with a former head of state, uh, the pre the, uh, what was his name? Uh, the one who came just before Ian Kama. Festus. Mokbohai. And he would froth on the mouth when it came to his desire to see all Basara people go towards civilization and leave those uh, forests mm. and game reserves and go into orderly development. How mm. are we going to assist them? if they're not in orderly lines, like the British taught us, bring everybody in the <laughs> How are we going to civilize them? And here is actually mm. a very, mm. very capable, mm. good manager, mm. one of the best presidents the country has had, but he's carrying this paradigm in his head, mm. and the Basara people are a typical example of people who mastered their environment so well, and their way of living that they practically are the most efficient people on the African continent. They don't need a government to survive, but they could tell, they could tell, they could show our heads of states and governments how to leave people alone. Uh, and they will do better than, uh, you know, an irresponsible government. And that's where maybe I might, uh, when I appear to contradict myself uh, in terms of tenure, uh, it's because, and this is my final point, in Africa, I look at tenure and all the issues we're talking about. Again, there's three possible paradigms. Do you, are you going to have tenure, security, or agricultural growth development where you have one state anarchy? So it's a choice between state anarchy or a market anarchy, or what I would call traditional anarchy. <laughs> and I can tell you, as an African who grew up in the village and seen all the life etc. Uh, at the top of my preference would be traditional anarchy. I'd rather live under traditional anarchy than a government anarchy in Africa. Because I'll probably survive it and, 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 and I'll probably know how to cope with it. <laughs> it's a toss up between market anarchy <laughs> and state anarchy. <laughs> so that's why you find that I would argue strongly for the traditional system and the way of getting it to survive under a state system. But Africans are so poor at allowing the state to support ordinary people that what we're calling, what you have a 99 year lease in this country and it's a perfect tool here. I mean, it has allowed uh, the, the British people to have access to land which they never had access to it because it was always in the hands of a few. But I've, I'm not gonna push for that in, in most African countries because the government won't be able to administer it. Not that is a bad instrument. Mm -hmm. But if the government could be responsible enough and put in place capability to manage it, then it will be a liberating effect. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Manda. Okay, um, and with apologies for the delay, let me draw the meeting to a close, thanking our three, our three speakers, Mandy Rakuni, Phil Woodhouse, and Robin Palmer. And just, just, just to say, the, 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 the final meeting in this will be in two weeks' time on the 5th of, 5th of October. We'll announce it later this week, probably at midday. And that will take the form of a panel discussion on the future of, of rural Africa. Um, and the leader of the, 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 the panel that we've got lined up for that, some of you will know her, Lindy Sibanda from uh, Fanapan in, in southern Africa. But thank you ever, much, ever so much uh, for coming along today.